Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Foundations in Faith, taking a look at those uh, foundational teachings of Christianity, yes, but Lutheranism over and against the other denominations as well, what we really believe being part of the LCMS, uh, what we believe according to Scripture, first and foremost, as Scripture forms all of our thoughts, all of our thinking, all of our instruction, our doctrine, all of that good stuff about God, about Jesus, about sin, like we'll be talking about today, um, but also walking through this big fat book, as I pull it up, the Book of Concord. Um, it's a whole bunch of documents from early within the Lutheran movement because they had to defend their movement against Roman Catholic teaching and belief. Uh, so they walked through a lot of these things. They talked about a lot of these things. They dove into a lot of these subjects as well um, and really fleshed out what that means within the Lutheran perspective. So that's why we're walking through um, this book as well. But today, uh, if you've been following along, we had a little bit of an intro uh, session, and then we talked about God. We talked about a little bit of his characteristics, but first and foremost, that God is creator. God has created everything around us. God has created the universe. God has created you and me. And as such, God has placed certain rules, certain laws, we would call them, in place for his creation. This is from the very beginning, uh, from the very beginning of everything that we see. God has ordered and ordained things to be in a certain way. Um, if you've read Genesis, you know that doesn't last terribly long. We don't really know the time frame uh, between creation of Adam and Eve and the fall. Speculation, this isn't within scripture, this is speculation, uh, so please hear me on that. But I would say not too long, because God does give the command to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and before they have a child, before they've fulfilled part of that command, uh, we see them being kicked out of the Garden of Eden. We see the fall. Uh, so I do invite you to read the narrative of the fall. I'm not going to walk through it here, just for time, but you can look it up. Genesis, the early chapters, 2, 3, and 4 kind of narrate uh, what happened in that situation. As Adam and Eve eat from that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, as they turn against God's command there, um, and as the consequences are laid out. But we are talking about those consequences. We are talking about the fall. We are talking about sin. And today specifically focused on original sin. So as we trace through the, the book of Concord here, how the, the early Lutherans set out their arguments and took a look at scripture, really what they did is take a look at the meta-narrative of scripture. And what I mean by that is um, all of scripture is divided into books. As you read the early parts of scripture, yes, it's kind of a history of ancient Israel. And then it gets into law and prophecy and all those good things. Um, and you can take each book individually. It has a message it's trying to share. It has something that it's trying to tell you about God, about creation, about mankind. But if you take all of scripture together, if you look at the grand story arc of scripture, that's called the meta narrative of scripture. And what that looks like is God creates, then there's the fall into sin. And then the redemption of mankind going forward all the way to the end, all the way to Revelation, which Vicar Josh is walking through right now. So I invite you to tune into that Bible study as well. It's up on the YouTube channel. You can see we're looking at the beginning a little bit now. You can walk through the end with Vicar Josh as well. But we are looking at that meta -narrative. meta narrative. We're looking at sin. What is sin? This is kind of the second portion of what happens within the history of the universe. God creates God creates man, God creates and gives laws, and then man destroys. Man breaks down those laws. Man doesn't follow those laws. And so as we turn against God, as we decide to go our own way, as Adam and Eve did by eating that fruit uh, from that tree, there's something that's broken within creation. And what's broken? Yeah, we might say, okay, it's mankind is broken. We might say the earth is broken. Really what's broken is the relationship between God and and creation. That relationship ceases to exist in the perfect harmony that it was before because God cannot abide sin. God does not like sin. God is angry over sin. Sin cannot be in God's presence. And so that relationship that Adam and Eve had with God as they walked with him in the garden, that relationship that we should have with God is broken as Adam and Eve sin. But this applies not only to mankind, not only to you and me, this applies to all of creation to earth, to animals, to other people, to the plants, to the weather, all that good stuff. Um, so this original sin, this false sin being present in the world, is the reason that we have death. It's the reason that we have viruses. It's the reason that we have earthquakes and fires and tsunamis. It's the reasons that we have diseases and sicknesses. Uh, it's because of that broken relationship 
that creation has with its creator. So as we walk through scripture, what we see, and as we walk through uh, the book of Concord, what we see is that sin and that broken relationship doesn't apply only to Adam and Eve. Really, this applies to all mankind. As mankind reproduces, as more people fill out the earth, sin sticks with us. That relationship is not fixed between God and man. That relationship is still broken. That continues on through history. This is what we would call original sin. It's the inherent sin in human nature. The inherent fact of that broken relationship going all the way back to Adam. And so we would say from conception, from the time that we are conceived, man is sinful. We are in need of a savior. We are lost unless someone comes and saves us from our sin. Uh, and along with that, scripture is very clear that it's not something that we can do for ourselves. We cannot save ourselves from our sin. We'll dive into that more in just a little bit, um, but just putting it out there, kind of where we're going within this video, that we cannot save ourselves. Someone has to actually come into our lives. Someone has to actually change us and save us from our sin to fix that relationship that is broken. Because we cannot turn towards God on our own power. We, we're actually turned away from God. We're turned against God uh, in our own human, natural, sinful nature. And this is foundational to Lutheran belief, especially over and against kind of the Roman Catholic teaching of the time that you can earn righteousness, that you can earn your way back into a relationship with God, that you can do enough good works to save yourself. And as Luther was diving into scripture and reading through scripture and thinking about these things, really he came to the conclusion, it's very clear, we can't save ourselves. And so that's why he split from the Roman Catholic Church. And that's why we dive into scripture. That's why we believe as well. We cannot save ourselves. Someone has to come into our life and save us. And this is because our whole beings are turned away from God. And it's only through his gifts and it's only through his love that we even come to know him, that we even come to know of him, that we even know to come of his love for us, and that we can be saved through Jesus. Um, so I have a few scripture verses. Uh, I invite you to pull out your Bible, follow along, flip through. You can pause the video as you're flipping into uh, different passages. But just to lay out that all of mankind is sinful. This isn't something that only applies to Adam and Eve. This isn't something that only applies to you when you first sin. Uh, so it's not like you're good and you're holy and you're pure when you're born. And then the first time you cry when your mom tells you not to cry, well, then you haven't respected your mom. You haven't listened to her commands. So now you've sinned. So now you're fallen. No, it's actually that from conception, we are sinful creatures. Um, we need someone to come and save us. So the first passage I have for you is Psalm 51, verses 3 through 6. And here the psalmist is writing, this is David writing, and confessing from his inner being to God. He says, I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. There he's speaking to God. He's done what's evil in God's sight. So that you are proved right when you speak. You're justified when you judge. As God is the judge of his creation. That's his rightful place. Um, and so he is right to judge sin. David goes on to continue. Uh, Surely I was sinful at my birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. So the confession there of David is that he has been sinful from the time that he was conceived. This doesn't apply only to David. This applies to all mankind. This is a truth of what it means to be a fallen creature, a fallen human creature, that we are sinful from the time we're conceived. I'm flipping now to Romans chapter 3. I will be spending quite a bit of time in Romans today. I have quite a few verses, but right now Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Um, these should be pretty familiar to you. A lot of kids memorize these. We should memorize these verses um, because they speak the basic truth of Romans, really the whole book there, but also of Christianity. As Paul says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That all is inclusive. Not just adults, not just children who are of an age to be able to understand these things. No, all human creatures, all creatures have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Verse 24, they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. And so there's a little bit of hope in there, too. We are fallen. We are broken. We are sinful. We cannot save ourselves. But Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus does what we cannot. 
So that's for our next video. We're talking about Jesus and redemption and salvation uh, in a week and, and two weeks from now. But just for today, I want to focus in on 23, that all have sinned. Not just humans, or not just adults, all people from the time they are conceived are sinful. I'm going to flip over one more verse here um, to Romans chapter 5. This is Romans 5, 17 to 19. It says, For if by the trespasses of one man death reigned through that one man. There Paul is speaking about Adam. He's speaking about the trespass of Adam not listening to God's command, taking that fruit and eating it for himself. And because of that, sin entered the world. That relationship is broken. Death entered the world. Because of his trespasses of one man, death affects us all. But how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of the trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. So Paul there again being very clear. Because of Adam's sin, sin is passed down to all of us. The consequences of sin are passed down to all of us. We all experience the pangs of death, the pangs of sin in our lives, of disease, of brokenness, because of that broken relationship with God the Father. And again, he's very clear that we cannot come to know God, we cannot come to know Jesus, unless he first reveals himself to us. That salvation is there in Jesus Christ, that he has come to fix that relationship, to renew, to restore that relationship that we have with God the Father, so that we don't suffer from the effects of sin. But we cannot turn to God on our own. This is something God has to do for us as Jesus reveals himself to us. Um, so for that, I have 1 Corinthians 2, um, chapter 2, verse 14. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are the foolishness to him. They are foolishness to him. Um, if you hear someone speaking about God and you, you don't have God revealed to you in your life, it sounds like foolishness. This is saying that someone that can't hear about God, someone that doesn't hear about God, that isn't told about God and Jesus, will not be able to find God on their own because it doesn't make sense. Because the story of Jesus, of God himself coming and dying on the cross, just doesn't make sense to humanity. To a sinful, fallen, broken human creature, it doesn't make any sense that God would die in that way. But he goes on to say, uh, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. We need that spiritual discernment, that gift of spiritual discernment that God gives us. That's just another way of saying God has to reveal himself to us. God has to come to us that we cannot go to God ourselves. Someone has to come to us and do that work for us. Um, finally, I have one last verse here, Matthew chapter 16. Um, I forgot to bookmark this one, so I invite you to skip ahead or, or find it with me in your scriptures here. Um, this is Matthew 16, verse 17. I just want to set the context for you a little bit here. Um, this is Peter's confession of Christ. And so Peter co or Christ comes to the disciples and says, Who do people say that I am? Oh, well, what's kind of the gossip around who I am? And then he says to the disciples, who do you say I am? Not just the people out there, but the disciples who have been traveling and learning from Jesus. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answers, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. So even the disciples, the people that were living and working and traveling with Jesus, it has to be revealed to them. They couldn't come to understand it on their own. God had to speak into their lives through the person of Jesus Christ so they could even understand who Jesus is. And as we walk in through the, uh, the disciples' lives in the time of Jesus on earth, they even really don't fully understand until Jesus has ascended, until he's sent the Spirit into their lives so that they can understand why Jesus had to come, why Jesus had to fix that broken relationship that they have with God the Father. So all of that is speaking towards uh, we cannot come to know Jesus on our own because of our sin, because of our fallen state. We are just completely turned away from God. We have essentially put blinders on ourselves so that we can't see God. Even if we wanted to, even if we had some concept of, okay, who is this God? Great. But God has to reveal himself to us for us to fully understand. 
Um, and this is picked up very clearly within the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, uh, one of those founding documents. This is the second article dealing with original sin. And they say, thus when the traditional definition says that sin is the absence of righteousness or a right relationship with God, it speaks not only about that relationship, not only about that we don't keep his commands, it also speaks about the knowledge of God, trusting God, fear and love of God, or certainly the power needed to produce those things. So we don't even have fear, love, or trust in God. We can't produce those things of ourselves. They say even the scholastic theologians teach that these cannot be produced without certain gifts and without the assistance of grace. So they were very clear even back in the early days of the Lutheran movement. This isn't something we can do for ourselves. It requires the assistance of grace. Original sin speaks to the fact that in our sinful, in, in our sinful nature, we're turned away from God. We wanted to show that original sin, I'm sorry, this is from the Apology, uh, again, Article 2. We wanted to show that original sin also included these maladies. Ignorance of God, contempt for God, the absence of the fear and of trusting God, and the inability to love God. These are the chief defects of human nature. This is something that's inherited, again, from Adam. It's something that's passed down because of what's called original sin. This is our natural state when we're born. This is our natural state before Jesus comes into our lives and reveals himself, that we are turned away from God. We are ignorant of him, and most of the time we don't even want anything to do with him. It requires God coming into our lives and revealing himself to us. Now all of that to say, it's not that we don't have gods. We love gods in our lives. Human nature is that we are creatures, and as creatures we want to serve something. Whether we realize that, whether we say it in that vocabulary or not, we are in service to something. We are in service to money. We are in service to our reputation. We slave after those things. They become gods in our lives. What this is saying is not that we don't have gods, but rather that we're turned away from the God of Scripture, that we're turned away from our Creator and have made gods of portions of creation, whatever that may be. Uh, we make gods of the earth. There are people who worship the earth. We make gods of, again, money or reputation. We make gods of our family. We make gods of our children. These are the places that we put our ultimate fear, love, and trust. This is where we find our identity. And it's broken. And it should not be that way. Our ultimate fear, love, and trust, our identity should come from our Creator. But because of our sinful nature, we then place it in these different things. Uh, again, from the Apology, Therefore, we correctly expressed both components in our description of original sin, namely these deficiencies, the in inability to believe God, the inability to fear and love God, the desire for carnal things contrary to the word of God. That is, it pursues not only the desires of the body, but also carnal wisdom and righteousness in which it trusts while despising God. And so because of sin, because of this brokenness, we desire to make God's but of things that we think are wisdom, things that we think will be good for our lives, things that we think we can put our fear, love, and trust in. And that's all the effects of sin in our lives. So why is this important? Um, because to understand how much grace we have received, to understand the work of Jesus Christ in our lives, we first have to understand how bad our brokenness really is. How bad is it? Not only have we sinned against our Creator, not only have we broken that relationship with our Creator, but then we've taken aspects of His creation, other creatures, other created things, and put them in the place of our Creator. That relationship is so broken that we've placed other things in that spot in our lives. And so God, as Psalm said earlier, in His justice, in his role as creator, as the one who can give law, as the one who can give punishment for breaking that law, in his justice, he is fully right in condemning the world. He could have wiped us all out. He could say, I want nothing to do with you. I'm going to destroy the earth. I'm going to destroy mankind. The full punishment of sin is on mankind. Um, and spoilers, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, the punishment of sin is placed on someone else. Again, we'll get there in a few weeks. Um, but in his justice, that would be right. That would be true to his nature. That would be true to the nature of sin, not being able to abide in the presence of God. God decides to do something about that. God decides to give forgiveness of sins 
through Jesus Christ. But we have to emphasize how great that breach is between mankind and God because of sin. How great our brokenness is, how great our sin is, that we cannot be in the presence of God because of our sin. And this is inherited. This is what we call original sin. This is part of human nature since the fall of mankind. Um, one more um, scripture to put before you. I said we'd be spending some time in Romans. This is from Romans chapter 6. Um, and again, just emphasizes how great that brokenness is. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. It's very blunt. It's very clear. Because of our sinful nature, because of our fallenness, we will die. That's what sin causes. Sin causes death. Now again, there's hope. Jesus comes. Jesus gives eternal life. Jesus gives forgiveness of sins. But we have to emphasize the severity of our sin, the severity of our brokenness, so that we can fully understand what God has done for us uh, through Jesus Christ on the cross. So as we circle back around to the beginning a little bit, we've kind of dealt with the spiritual reality of original sin. What does that mean for our relationship with God? that we cannot turn towards him, that we place other things in his role. Uh, but again, there's a physical reality as well, and I touched on this at the beginning. But because of sin, all creation is broken. Everything that is created suffers from sin. You see that in early Genesis. What's cursed in Genesis? Not only man, not only woman, but also the ground. The earth is cursed. This is why we have weeds and thorns and thistles. Why, this is why the earth doesn't produce as much as it could. This is why we have natural disasters, sickness, the breakdown of bodies, diseases, death. This is all the effects of sin in our lives, in our world, in our universe, um, because of Adam and Eve eating that fruit from the garden. So to summarize, um, from conception, we are turned away from God because of original sin. We cannot save ourselves. And it's only by an act of God that we can be put back into a right relationship with him. That right relationship, that act of God as he reveals himself to us, um, that's going to be the subject of our next few videos as we look towards the work and the person of Jesus Christ. Until that time, I invite you to tune in to the other videos that we have going on in this channel. Uh, if you want to leave comments, you can do that at the bottom of this YouTube video. You can also email me, Pastor Andrew at stpaulboca.com, stpaulboca.com. Um, all our worship services are up there as well. We invite you to be with us in worship this weekend, and we'll see you next week as we talk about Jesus.